Many Canadians are familiar with the contributions of our country's veterans in the First World War, but less well known are the artists and other civilians whose work helped forge Canada's identity from the scarred battlefields of Europe. Mary Ryder Hamilton is one of those artists, a painter whose work captured the devastating costs of war, but whose work has been rarely remembered. And so, joining us now for more on her life and legacy is Irina Gamel. She is a professor of English and Canada Research Chair in Modern Literature and Culture at Ryerson University. Welcome to our program. Thank you for being here. I'm excited to learn about Mary Ryder Hamilton. Super. Okay, so Canadians are familiar with a group of seven. But her name, you know, isn't as familiar. So who was Mary Ryder Hamilton? Mary Ryder Hamilton was uh, a painter who had been trained in Europe. She was actually well established in Canada, living out in Vancouver at the time, very much identifying also with the West, although she was born actually in Ontario. Teeswater, Ontario, what we today consider Lucy, not Lucy but Montgomery, uh, Alice Monroe country. And uh, in uh, 1918, when the war broke out, Mary Ryder Hamilton desperately wanted to go back to Europe. Her goal was to go out and paint the battlefields of Europe. She wanted to be right there and trace what was happening and wanted to do that on behalf of her country because Canada, of course, was involved in this war right from the very start. And, but she wasn't allowed to go. Because? Women were allowed <laughs> to paint the uh, home front and uh, so it was very gendered, and uh, some men were sent. What do you mean women were, were had to paint the home front? Ca the Canadian government said, yeah, you're not going over. You're staying exactly. at home to paint. This was just the time kind of with the emergence of the National Gallery, for example, and uh, there were, you know, some art bureaucrats at the time who were in charge, and uh, it, basically they decided uh, the way in which everything was going to be distributed was the women were painting the home front as well as some men were painting the home front, but men were basically sent to uh, the war and men were sent, let's say, to be part of the larger uh, Lord Beaverbrook uh, team, let's say, that was painting. And so at the time, I mean, the Lord Beaverbrook team was, was a large team. He had over 100 men uh, and some women employed and uh, uh, they were combing the battlefields but also painting the home front itself. And uh, so Mary was only allowed to go when the war was over. Okay, so she wanted to go all throughout the war. She's like, pick me, they say, no way, Absolutely. you're a woman, you're not going. Yeah. So we're in 1919 and Mary says, forget it, I'm heading over. How did she exactly. get there? <laughs> exactly. Well, the fascinating thing that really intrigued me was that she was actually sent by the soldiers themselves. They were returning soldiers in Vancouver and it was the British Columbia Amputations Club actually so she was in very close contact with them. The she, BC War Amps? Exactly. Yeah. She donated some paintings to them that were raffled off even uh, during the war effort itself and then after the war they said we'll commission you, you go, we pay for your trip. So they paid for her and also paid sort of for the first year that she was staying in Europe. And uh, during that time, then Mary immersed herself in the battlefields themselves. And what I always find very fascinating about Mary is that she painted 350 battlefield paintings, which is more than any Canadian war artist painted by far. I want to go back to her motivation. I mean, was she an aristocrat? She was not. So sort of she came from a pioneer uh, family. Her parents were farmers, a uh, family of five children. Uh, they were by no means rich. They had a, a wonderful homestead uh, in, um, uh, in Teeswater or Culross. And uh, the um, uh, but disaster kind of struck. The family lost the farm and they moved out west okay. basically and started Given that, again. You know, she, she knew full well they weren't going to send a woman over. Why, yeah. why, why did she want to get to Europe so badly during the war years? I think she wanted to tell the story. I think, I mean, there was so much at the time in terms of reporting this war. It was a highly reported war. It was one of the uh, largest uh, uh, wars that had ever happened. I mean, it cost so many Canadian lives. And so from around 1916 on, 
almost at the same time that Lord Beaverbrook had the same idea in London, Mary said, I would like to go, I would like to trace this, and she lobbied and she lobbied and she lobbied. And so she was really, in a way, I mean, it's a cliche to say it, but ahead of her time in thinking about this, but she had a plan. She kind of wanted to go and she was determined to tell that story. We also have to keep in mind that uh, even though the war was reported on so much, there was a lot of propaganda. Uh, the news could not always be trusted. And at times when the news arrived and was printed the next day, the fate on the battlefield might already be reversed through a counterattack. So it was important to her to be right there. And she always considered that her life's work. And in the end, it did become her life's work. And do we know what her attitude to the war was during the war years? She was certainly, she spoke very strongly the discourse of patriotism, as many women did, especially early on in that war. And uh, in that sense, uh, she kind of presented herself, even when she contacted uh, uh, the prime minister at the time, Sir Robert Borden, who was actually a collector of her work. He had some of her works. And she would be speaking the very strong language of patriotism, mm. to do something for the country itself. If our boys can do this, so can I. Yeah, not that unlike the so many thing. soldiers who said, I want to go there because I want to be part of this, this great effort at the, exactly. at the time. OK, you, you mentioned that the prime minister had some of her paintings. She was a well-respected painter in this country. And we're going to look at some of her paintings in a, a, a bit. But describe her work for us. How would you describe her as a painter? As a painter, she came out of that sort of post-impressionistic tradition. She had a very good reputation as a colorist. So she was very particular about her use of colors. She would grind her own colors. And so that kind of finessing is, is very clear in her sort of post-impressionist paintings. When she hit the battlefields, that became very, very different. The style changed dramatically. And what I always find fascinating is as if Mary stepped onto the battlefield and had a new style, looking at what she saw kind of really uh, gave her a new way of looking at the world. And uh, what I find fascinating in the painting, uh, paintings themselves is that she generally has a way of taking herself very close to the ground and uh, close to the trenches, that is close to where the actual soldiers were. The soldiers were buried in these trenches. I mean, this was a war of attrition with soldiers kind of living in the underground. Often the soldiers couldn't come out because it would be dangerous. There would be, uh, they, they would be shot if they, if they showed themselves. And so the war really took place underground. And Mary herself puts herself underground and is very close to where the soldiers were at the same time that she also produces a work that is beautiful, that uh, kind of shines with its use of colors and contrasts and so forth. So we're talking this summer uh, about other artists, including A.Y. Jackson, who also, uh, of course, painted for Canada. Um, I mean, you sort of just took us through how, how Mary's work stands apart. Were there other differences if you, if you compare her to someone like an A.Y. Jackson? The other thing that I find fascinating about Mary is that uh, she certainly had that determination to go to the war, see it for herself. But there was also that humanitarian aspect that she had right from the start. She deeply, profoundly cared for the soldiers and the soldiers' families. And so what I find fascinating in Mary's work is that she injects that empathy, that compassion with the experience itself. She herself had gone through tremendous loss in her life. Uh, she lost her first baby at a young age. And then less than a year after that, she lost her husband. Very, very young. They were very happily married. She was barely 25 when that happened. She never married again, but she kind of carried that memory. Mm. And I think that was part of the experience as well that she took to the battlefields themselves. We have to remember that in the First World War, where so many soldiers died, and probably senselessly, I think many of us would agree, um, the soldiers were not repatriated at that time. So they were a very long way of, uh, away from home. They basically were buried at first just very briefly and at times uh, in, the, in the darkness of the night where they fell. So there were a lot of temporary crosses after the war. And uh, those were the crosses that Mary basically so painted. So this is the scene she arrives to when she arrives in 1919 is 
bodies exactly. everywhere. I mean, Pretty the war's over, but, but gruesome stuff that, that she, she arrives upon. Absolutely. So we have to remember at that time, there were still so many soldiers uh, missing in action. Many of them whose bodies were kind of dispersed over the battlefields, more or less buried. Uh, some were kind of buried in these temporary graves. And what was happening in 1919 was that the War Graves Commission, including the, uh, the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, but also the Canadian War Graves Commission, were out there doing that work of basically looking for those bodies and uh, exhuming the bodies and then burying them properly in these mass graves as we know them and today. And so Mary is there at the same time trying to capture That's right. you know, the, the ravages of war. What obstacles was she up against when she first gets there? Well, that's a good question. I mean, first of all, uh, when you headed out into the battlefield, so a little bit further out, at times she would stay for a day. Uh, in many of these cases, she didn't have enough food, she didn't have enough water. So over the stretch, she was there for two and a half years. You could see the aging process in Mary herself in the sense that uh, she didn't eat enough, she didn't drink enough. And uh, the, uh, they were very actual dangerous in there too. I mean, you, if you wanted to descend into a trench, for example, by this time the trench was several months old, they hadn't been upkept, they could collapse on a person. So that was dangerous. There were fuses and shells, unexploded shells still out there. So the Battlefields were in the process of being cleaned up, but it was a year-long effort. I mean, it was a four-year war, but it took almost mm. as long, if not longer. And she lived with the, the Canadian mess. contingent for, for, for much of that time. Absolutely. So she was embedded with the Canadian uh, soldiers at that time and the Canadian camps. But some of these camps were slowly closing up. Mm. The boys were being sent home. So by spring, summer, the boys were basically back home in Canada but Mary was still there. I read somewhere, tell me if this is correct, that she, she, she lived with Chinese workers for a time as well. Is that true? There were, at the time, uh, Chinese workers cleaning up the fields. We know actually quite little about these Chinese workers, and I find their story very, very interesting because they also contributed a lot to the war. And uh, so the Chinese workers were on site helping with the cleanup itself, both at Vimy and in other areas. And so uh, they were there and they would even, uh, in one case, when Mary moved uh, her hut, let's say, from one camp to another, these Chinese workers, about 20, would come along, lift up this entire Nissan hut and carry it in one piece from one camp to the other with everything mm. inside. So she reported on that and was quite proud of that. And, and as we established at the beginning of our conversation, I mean, she's not even really supposed to be there as a woman painter. Post-war, so 1919, I mean, what is it like for her? Is she treated differently because she's a woman over there painting the trenches? That's a very interesting question. I mean, the uh, she certainly, I mean, just stepped in there. And she had a very good way with people, and I think especially with the soldiers. So she went out, she uh, talked to the soldiers, she talked to the drivers, she also talked to the peasants. She was constantly kind of searching after information. She wanted to know what are those various places where the Canadian soldiers had fought, not just the big ones that we all know about. She captured those as well. Uh, but she also wanted to know about the lesser known places. And so she was constantly on the prowl, as it were, and looking for those various places. Sounds like a pretty good journalist to me. I think so too, <laughs> I think so too. Okay, let's look at some of her work, some of the, big, the, the battlefields that she painted, some of the big, we're gonna start with sure. the Somme. This is called uh, Trenches on the Somme. Tell me about this painting. So here we find Mary at the Somme. She painted a, about a dozen paintings of the Somme itself. Of course, the Somme was in really, really bad shape at that time. And what we see here, what Mary truly captures is a trench with the poppies growing inside. The trench itself uh, kind of is white chalk. It looks almost like snow, but it is white chalk. And what it basically means is that the earth is just totally churned up. And the only thing that will grow is these poppies. So you have these fields of poppies mm. kind of growing. And here in the painting, you see they are both beautiful. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful painting. But at the same time, you also know these poppies grow because everything is churned up and destroyed. Many painters uh, painted the Somme, of course, big battle. Um, what do you think stands out about her painting of her, how she captured it? 
I think she truly went to some of the places, let's say, uh, where the, the, the Canadian soldiers had fought and tried to capture that. So she went, for example, strategically to that stretch from uh, Albert, little village of Albert that had been absolutely destroyed, and uh, to Bapom. And Bapom had still been in the hands of the Germans, basically. So she covered that stretch. So when you look at it, what Mary actually performs in her paintings is drawing a Canadian war map. I find that very, very mm. interesting and compelling, that she went out systematically, even though her health was faltering toward the end, and she's capturing all of these different places and drawing a map for us, Canada at war. Hmm. Okay, let's go to another one of her stops. This is Vimy Ridge, uh, Farber's Wood Gun Emplacements. Tell me about this painting. This is also one of my favorites because, again, you have the uh, colors. You can really see that Mary is a colorist. There is the green, there is the blue, there is the black, there is the brown. And at the same time, she captures, of course, a scene that is very important in the Canadian imagination. It's Vimy Ridge, you know, stormed on the 9th of April, 1917, and successful, and uh, where the Canadians basically made their names as fighting together as a, a unit. And what we find here with Farbus Wood is actually the eastern part of the Vimy Ridge. The Germans were in possession of the eastern part as well as the crest, and so as the Canadians stormed the Vimy Ridge, they got to the eastern part uh, after, this was after the, um, the um, uh, uh, April 9th uh, attack, and they were able to take the gun emplacements. These gun emplacements were very important because they were basically these concrete shelters, and they were full with guns. In the painting, you can see also the camouflage around it. There are the stumps of the trees, for example. And uh, uh, the Germans were so successful because they had buried themselves into these, uh, into the trenches, but also had the gun emplacements that were pretty ferocious and successful in defending that ridge. And what the Canadians did, even in advance of uh, storming, uh, Vimy Ridge is finding out where exactly they were located mm -hmm. and taking some of them out already beforehand so that the uh, taking of the ridge was uh, was smoother. It is interesting. The number of her paintings have really sort of um, long titles. I mean, was that a deliberate thing? I mean, it's just not sort of location and, and date. They have longer, long, Vimy Ridge, Farber's Wood, Gun Emplacements. We'll talk about some others. Was that a deliberate thing on her part? Uh, most of the time, Mary was very much no-nonsense about her title. She would give the title, uh, you know, Écurie or Telus or wherever it was. and. Uh, but in some uh, cases, she would be more descriptive. And so this one is one of them. Do you know why she wanted to be more descriptive in some of them? Because I think it was so important to her. This was number one, Vimy Ridge. So she wanted to highlight that. It was also Farbus Wood. And she actually happened upon a fascinating scene. The scene in that particular painting juxtaposes several elements. We have the gun emplacements, we have the woods kind of protecting all of that, and uh, we have a trench right in the foreground. There is this real gash in the earth, which is a trademark of Mary's as well to capture that. She puts herself right at the edge there. And then we have two isolated graves in there as well. So it was it was a very, very compelling scene. Okay, let's look at another one. This one's quite different. This is called Eep Cloth Hall. Okay, so here we come to Ypres, and of course Ypres was so important, both uh, to uh, Canada but also to the war itself, because um, uh, the Germans had basically taken the entire Belgium, except for Ypres and what was called the Ypres salient around it. And so there was fighting going on there during the duration of the war. What's fascinating about Mary's painting there, and what I love about it, is you see it here right after the war, and you see the cloth hall in the mid middle, which is basically a landmark in Vimy. And you see also the sprawling buildings that kind of along the side of the cloth hall, and they are all in ruins. Everything is in ruins. But what you still st see in the middle is the cloth hall itself still standing. So I think what Mary is capturing here is also the cloth hall as a kind of symbol mm. for the spirit of Vimy, that sort of spirit of resistance itself. Uh, even after four years of bombardment, we still see the cloth hall standing, we still see, see Ypres standing, and uh, so it's a symbol of endurance as well that she captured here. Okay, this one, next one is called Saint-Julien, uh, first gas attack launched here. 
Right. So that also is a very interesting uh, painting and one where she again gives this descriptive title. Uh, this was the place basically that is also very important in the Canadian imagination because it was the first time that Canadians were involved here uh, in the uh, Battle uh, of Ypres. So it was mm. the second Battle of Ypres, it was St. Julian. And what happened there at five o'clock in the afternoon uh, of the day, uh, Germans released gas was the first time that gas had been used. It was chlorine gas, which kind of, uh, if you get it in very small doses, you're going to be fine. But with higher doses, it's, it's lethal. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what happened uh, in, in that attack. It's in, her, her work is so interesting because it, it, it is so diverse. Uh, you know, Canadian Monument and Passchendaele, very different from Vimy Ridge, very different from the Ypres Clothal. Is there a theme that ties all her work together? I think the theme is Canada. So she's really looking at what the Canadian soldiers did, where they were. So it's all about that. She's not traveling to Verdun. She's not traveling to the Marne. She's not looking at the uh, Russian front. Mm. She focuses exclusively on Canada at war. Of course, at times we see, uh, let's say, other elements. We see the British soldiers. We <laughs> see multicultural soldiers in that mix as well. But she's pretty much looking at Canada at war. And given that, given that she's telling or to, she told our story, why has she been left out of art histories of Canada? Or at least, you know, only given a tacit mention. Yeah, good point, good point. Uh, I, I think there are uh, multiple reasons for it. I think one of the reasons um, is that uh, when she first, um, uh, let's say, when she completed her collection itself, she herself became very, very sick. She suffered from what, in retrospect, we would probably diagnosed as post-traumatic stress. She was hospitalized, it was pretty bad. She was at a stage where she actually couldn't paint anymore. And so at that point in time, she was not able to take her collection, let's say in 1921, 1922, take it back to Canada and really present it. By the time she was well again and had generated the funding again, to return home, it was 1926. And one of the articles read at that time when Mary came home, oh, our last war worker coming home. But by that time, Canadians had kind of also moved on a little bit. And uh, so there wasn't that keen interest in the war mm. anymore at that time. She donated the collection then to Canada itself, and uh, but it, she donated it at the time to um, Library and Archives Canada. She approached the National Gallery for it, but they said, no, we already have the Beaverbrook collection, and they didn't have the money to store all of this, so it went to Library and Archives Canada. Where, is that is, where they are now? That's where they are now, so that is where they are held in Ottawa. And most of the paintings actually in storage, so. Uh, we are also hoping to kind of have an exhibition to bring these paintings back to mm. life so they can be seen because they should be seen. I, I want to put uh, Mary Ryder Hamilton in the context of building Canadian national identity. Put her in that context for us. In a sense, what I find interesting about her is that with Mary Ryder Hamilton, we get an understanding of Canada uh, that uh, is kind of complementary, let's say, maybe to the official histories. Because what Mary Ryder Hamilton is all about, what attracts me to her story, is that it is a story from the grassroots. In other words, uh, here is a woman who was not sent in by the government, who did not have what the other war painters have, and that is, uh, a nice title, uh, an income, a status, uh, a driver, a car, and all of these things. She went on her own. She went uh, because she felt she had to go and do something. So hers is really a story from the grassroots. But I think what is important about it is that um, given that particular story, uh, it also makes Mary Ryder Hamilton part of the architecture of Canada from a grassroots level. Here being part of the war, being close to the front line, but being a woman. Mm. It was not what was being done at that time, but she did it. And a and hundred years on, I mean, do, do you think we still have this hierarchy in, in terms of how Canadians are taught uh, to, to value what 
came out of World World War One. I. I mean, it, do we still sort of put her at the at the bottom because she was a woman and wasn't sent in any sort of official capacity? Well, I hope we can reverse that a little bit. <laughs> That's <laughs> because, what we're trying to do <laughs> because times have changed, of course. And so I think it would be fantastic to see this particular story alongside the other more official stories that we hear. And that in no means uh, denigrates the official stories. There are some war historians, for example, Jack Granitstein, who is an important Canadian war historian, uh, who knows her work quite well. And uh, I was talking with him at a, at a get together a couple of years ago, and who thought very, very highly of Mary Ryder Hamilton's work. So it's not one or the other, mm. but it is a different sort of story. And with a, a different sort of twist that we get from a Mary Ryder Hamilton. Thank you. Thank you for telling me about her and our audience as well. Much appreciated. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.